today I've got another one of those were they any good types of videos, uh, a retrospective if you want to call them that, something that I put in a separate playlist along with regular storytime stuff, so this will be in the regular storytime playlist as well as one called driver and team retrospectives, so if that's all you want to watch then they're all there. So what I do is I take a driver or a team that was racing at some point in Formula 1 history, usually within the last 20 or 30 years, and we see with facts and stats and other bits and pieces if they were better than we thought, as good as we thought, mid, bad, or just, oh my god, this was worse than I could have ever imagined. And I do enjoy doing these kinds of videos because I get to look at drivers from about 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago or teams that came and went in a similar time period and see what it was that didn't make them achieve what they were supposed to achieve. Jaguar not achieving much because Ford simply didn't care. Toyota spending billions to never win a race because they had to do things the Toyota way. Prost being hampered by promises from the very top in government that never materialised. And that's just the teams. Then you've got the likes of David Coulthard, Jean Alesi, Heinz Howard Frensen, Giancarlo Fisichella or Jarno Trulli. So with this sort of thing you can bet that there's more to come. I like spreading these ones out because I don't want to run out of things to write about too quickly. It's a big brain moment on my part. Now for this one we're going to go back to the latter part of the first decade of the 2000s when Formula One saw the first driver from Poland to take to the grid and with him came legions of vocal fans who followed their country's representative into the sport with the hope that he could achieve big things. Today we're talking about Robert Kubica. If Stefan Beloff is a big what if, then Kubica is the Beloff moment of the last 25 years. Kibitz's entry into the junior categories was a little bit late, at least when it came to the Formula 3 Euro Series. The previous two years he'd been in the Formula Renault 2000 Euro Cup, which you might know better as Formula Renault 2.0, and it was rebranded Regional Formula 3. Unfortunately, that series is now defunct, even though it was a brilliant series, and it's now been replaced by various regional Formula 3 series as the FIA consolidated the ladder to be more biased towards using its own series to come to the top of Formula 1. Anyway, back to what I was on about. Kibitz's entry to Formula 3 Euro Series in 2003 was late. He'd suffered a broken arm in a road accident and he had to have screws holding his arm together as it healed. He was able to return to racing in time for the round of the Norris Ring and drove with 18 titanium bolts in his arm and a plastic brace. And he won. He'd finished the season 12th overall, but it was a great starting point in a series that he'd missed a few races of, and it was also a series that over the next two years would be stacked with future pro racing driver talent. Just within that 2003 season were Nico Rosberg, Alex Prema, Bruno Spengler, Jamie Green, Nicola Lapierre, Ryan Briscoe, Timo Glock, Mauro Engel, Adam Carroll, Christian Kleen, and Marcus Winkelhock. Later that year, Kibitza would be second at the prestigious Macau Grand Prix and was looking forward to 2004. But Kibitza would be 7th the following year, and most of the drivers from the previous year would still be on the grid, with Lewis Hamilton joining and Guido van der Gaard, at least in terms of drivers that you might have heard of. Either way, 7th was the best he could do, with his two races at Estoril and the 17th place at Adria probably affecting his season, but at the end of it, he was off to Formula Renault, the 3.5 litre V8 series that was pretty awesome. In that season, Kibitza dominated. In terms of named drivers in that series that year, there was Will Power, who went on to have a lot of success in IndyCar, Simon Pagano, who would also win an IndyCar title, as well as being more well-known recently for crashing it in Lando Norris on a video game. Today, he's actually not racing in IndyCar with his seat taken by Felix Rosenfist because he crashed hard at mid-Ohio and needs to recover. But either way, Kibitza destroyed the field that year, and this caught the attention of BMW, who signed him up for test driver duties with the BMW Sauber F1 team. And BMW Sauber is definitely something that I need to look at doing, considering I've already done the whole BMW Williams stuff. Should BMW have stuck with Williams after all? Well, that's something that we need to find out. Kibitza joined the Sauber team in 2006, having done F1 tests with Renault after winning the Formula Renault 3.5 series. His performances in the free practice and test sessions were attracting some attention, and the way that team principal Mario Thiessen was talking about him started generating rampant speculation that at some point, the pole would be racing for the team in 2007, as Poland's first F1 driver and one of the first drivers born on the other side of the Iron Curtain to participate in Formula 1. But in the latter part of the 2006 season, Jacques Villeneuve, another driver I need to look at in one of these videos, had been involved in an accident at the German Grand Prix and was complaining of headaches afterwards. So Sauber declared JV unfit to race and Kubica would race instead. 
Poland got its first F1 driver before 2007. Now, if you are a Polish racing fan, I'd like to know how big the speculation and all that was, because I'm struggling to find online articles and discussions about him, and to be honest, if I did find some, I'm probably not going to understand a word of it. I've worked with Polish people before in a real job and also through sim racing and esports where they've taught me how to pronounce certain names and things like that so I don't butcher it in commentary and stuff like that. And just the way some of those words are pronounced and some of the letters are pronounced, pff, head explode. But the thing is, Kibitza didn't think he was ready, but BMW put him in the car anyway. Compared to today, where drivers like Oli Behrman are just lobbed in a car and expected to just get along with it, Kibitza had at least already spent time in the BMW car prior to the Hungarian Grand Prix of 2006. The way the season worked back then is that the teams in the lower part of the championship standings, including BMW Sauber, were allowed to run an extra car on the Friday. So Kibitza had already driven at Bahrain and pretty much, if not every other race weekend. The 2006 Hungarian Grand Prix has had its own dedicated video, given that it was a controversial race before it had even begun, and it was the race where Jensen Button finally won a Grand Prix. But in that race, Kibitza finished 7th, but was then disqualified for having an underweight car. His car was 2 kilos underweight, the result of excessive tyre wear. So it's not just George Russell that it's happened to. The Turkish Grand Prix saw him finish 12th ahead of teammate Heidfeld, by which point Villeneuve had decided to walk away from Formula 1. At the Italian Grand Prix, another controversial race given that there were allegations of Ferrari international assistance at home, Kibitza was 3rd, meaning both BMWs made the podium at some point during the course of the season. But it would be the only points scored for Kibitza in the latter part of 2006, seeing as he was 13th, 9th and 9th, which actually isn't a bad outing. He actually finished the season just one point behind JV, which is, again, not a bad outing. For comparison, Heidfeld had 23 points. So then, we move into 2007. This would be the big test, against a driver who was regarded as being one of the most solid drivers in the paddock and one of the best wranglers of a mid-tier car of all time. That last part being my personal opinion. And the car that they had that year was a contender for best of the rest. I'll go into more of a deep dive on it when I do the actual BMW Sauber video, but we'll just have a quick overview here and now. It's probably the best car that Kibitza had in his F1 career, at least across the entirety of a season, because well, we'll get to the 2008 stuff a little bit later on. The BMW F1.07 was an insane step up from what they had the year before. McLaren and Ferrari were dominating the season between Alonso, Raikkonen, Hamilton and Massa. Of the 51 possible podium spots on offer, McLaren and Ferrari occupied 46 of them, and Heidfeld was able to get two podiums over the course of the season, second in Canada and third in Hungary. But the car was so good that it was able to score points with at least one driver per race. That said though, Kibitza only beat Heidfeld twice all year when both cars finished. But Robert managed to score consistent points through the second half of the season, despite having an absolutely monster shunt at the same Canadian Grand Prix that Heidfeld finished second in. He had clipped the back of Trulli's Toyota, gone off at the kink before the hairpin, and slammed into a concrete wall at over 160 miles an hour. When he came to a stop, he wasn't moving, and many journalists in the paddock were wondering if they just witnessed a death. Robert got away with only a concussion and a sprained ankle, so he would be out for the US Grand Prix where he was replaced by some kid called Vettel, 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 it's pronounced Vettel, but the 2007 Canadian Grand Prix is definitely a race I need to look at as well because it had that monster shunt which can be looked at in a little bit more detail, but also at the time of writing it was the first of 105 Grand Prix wins. It really is mental how there is so much overlap between each episode of Storytime. Maybe I should do a, a diagram. Just stick Moreno in the middle and go from there. Heidfeld outscored Kibitza in this season by a good margin. 61 plays 39. But then you start factoring in the what-ifs. What if that crash never happened? Did the crash affect Kibitza's rest of the season? So on and so on and so on. But despite this, BMW finished third in the standings, later second when McLaren was booted out of the championship for the Spygate fiasco, which, thinking about it, is another video that needs doing. Well, remaking. It's a fun one, that one. You're going to love it. 2008, though, would be the breakthrough season. Kibitza did retire from the opening race in Melbourne, but would be second in Malaysia and then become the first pole on pole in Bahrain, where he'd finish third. The rest of the opening part of the season was highly impressive, given that the season was supposed to be Hamilton vs Raikkonen. 
Robert would then be fourth in Spain, fourth in Turkey, second at Monaco, and would then win the Canadian Grand Prix. A fairy tale win given what had happened the year before. And you can bet there's going to be a video on that one as well, going from being almost seriously injured or having career ending injuries to winning the race 12 months later. And it had other stuff going on as well because at the end of that Grand Prix, Robert was actually leading the driver's standings because Raikkonen had no scored, Hamilton had no scored because, well, he'd driven into the back of Raikkonen in the pit lane like an idiot, and Massa hadn't scored well either. So as it all sort of cancelled out and moved around, leading the championship. But that was as good as it got. Because BMW had achieved their goal, which was win a race. After that, they decided to dump the money and resources into the 2009 car in time for the new regulations, instead of attempting to hang with the McLarens and the Ferraris. As such, the results kind of suffered. While Robert would get a further podium at Valencia, Monza and Suzuka, the rest of the point scores when he was off the podium were 5ths, 6ths, 7ths and 8ths in the lower half of the points paying places. You'd think that he and BMW should have scored more podiums than they actually did that year. And BMW's decision to abandon the 2008 development for the 2009 season irritated Kibitza, given that they were closer than ever to Ferrari and McLaren. It was a truly baffling decision, and Renault catching up in the latter part of the season was showing, because Alonso scored two wins, I mean one of them highly controversial it has to be said, but Sauber still had that cushion to once again finish third in the standings. But then it all went backwards. Put simply, that 2009 car was a dog. Kibitza couldn't show what he was really capable of in it. He didn't score until the Turkish Grand Prix, but for the most part if he was finishing it was outside of the points. Fourth in the driver's standings, down to 14th, as the car wasn't giving him what he wanted. A second at the Brazilian Grand Prix that year was the only real highlight, and with Alonso leaving Renault for Ferrari, Kibitza took the vacant seat. Going back home, if you will. The turnaround was better than anybody could have expected. I went to look at his performance through 2010 and I'm thinking, hang on a minute, was it really that good for him that year? Because I don't remember much of 2010 because I was too busy watching McLaren, Ferrari and Red Bull scrapping for the title. But there was Kibitza just waiting to pick up all the scraps from the front six battling it out like they were. Now really, check this out, because of the races that he finished, Robert failed to score just once the Bahrain Grand Prix season opener. He was second in Australia, then fourth, fifth, eighth, third at Monaco, and just racking up all the points that it was possible to rack up. The car was so good with him in it and scoring so many points in just the hands of Kibitza that it was challenging Mercedes for fourth in the constructors. Ultimately, Renault would finish fifth, as Petrov in the other car wasn't scoring points as regularly. But it was a return to form for Robert, and showing the world that with a car under him that worked for him, he was going to go places. But he wasn't going to go places in Formula 1. While he had signed a pre-contract with Ferrari for the 2012 season, there would be a moment in his career that has now become probably the biggest what-if in modern Formula 1 history. While rallying in Italy in the early part of 2011, his Skoda Fabia left the road at high speed and made contact with a guardrail near the church in the town of Testico. Trapped inside the car, it took over an hour to free Robert from the vehicle, and in the crash he had sustained utterly horrendous injuries to his right arm. Not only had he suffered fractures to his right elbow, shoulder and leg, he had partially amputated his forearm and was losing blood. All this caused by the guardrail entering the car hitting the driver while the co-driver was completely unscathed. It actually reminds me of a rally accident I saw a couple of years ago in Poland as it so happens. A driver crashed into a metal fence separating the road from a river and as the car hits that fence one of the metal rods comes into the car through the windscreen in between the driver and the co-driver. It actually misses going into the co-driver's head by about four inches. It was like something out of Final Destination. To say that Kibitza needed to be put back together isn't some sort of sick joke. It's what happened. He was in surgery for seven hours and needed seven doctors split between working on his leg and his arm. And he was in hospital for two months before he could go home and start a long recovery. But the Ferrari dream didn't stop. And neither did the desire to go racing. Despite almost being killed in a rally car, Kibitza returned to the sport in 2013, driving in the WRC2 series. At his second rally on his return, the Acropolis Rally in Greece, he won by 90 seconds, despite his right arm atrophied and barely able to move. And then he would win the championship, despite the injuries and not having driven competitively for about two years. 
At the same time, he'd done some simulator work with the Mercedes team and had been competitive, but Mercedes was wary of putting him in a car at places like Monaco with the cockpits of an F1 car being what they are. In the same time period, various tests were conducted in LMP1 cars, GT3 cars and Formula E cars, but none of these produced a drive. But some tests in Formula 1 started a road to return that nobody thought would happen. In 2018, Kibitza was back in Formula 1 as Williams' test driver. At the 2018 Spanish Grand Prix, Robert would be back in a Formula 1 car and went faster than Lance Stroll, leading the more vocal Kibitza fans who would regularly bombard the Williams social media pages to demand that Robert be given the seat for the rest of the season. Stroll and Sorokin continued for the 2018 season, but when Sorokin left at the end of 2018, Kibitza was called up to one of the seats, alongside George Russell. At this point, it was clear that George was one of the up-and-coming talents, with Kibitza being outqualified and outraced every single time, leading those same vocal fans to claim that Kibitza was being deliberately sabotaged and given inferior equipment to George when it should be Robert getting it instead. Williams did receive more criticism at the Russian Grand Prix as Robert's car was retired to conserve parts, as Williams at this time was, well, quite the mess. Kibitza did, however, score a single point at the German Grand Prix of 2019 when Raikkonen and Giovinazzi in the Alphas were disqualified. His qualifying deficit to George actually wasn't too bad. It was like 0.5 of a percent. Latifi's, by comparison, in his first season was 0.6 of a percent, but in 2021 he'd got that down to 0.5 four of a percent and actually in the opening laps of a grand prix robert was usually quicker able to get past george and overtake him into turn one or turn two or wherever but as the race went on kibitza's pace dropped off probably because of his right arm at the end of 2019 kibitza would leave williams and go back to sauber now alfa romeo in 2020 he'd be the reserve driver and had some track time at barcelona and was fastest on the fourth day of testing he would also drive Austria, Hungary, Silverstone, Bahrain and Abu Dhabi to get some more experience. But then, in 2021, he'd get some more race time because Raikkonen had tested positive for Covid and at the Dutch Grand Prix, Kibitza was back. He was in more competitive machinery this time round, but as Josh Sutil wrote, he did have some issues beyond his control. Traffic got in his way at the first race he did at Zandvoort and then Mazepin held him up at Monza, so the qualifying laps weren't showing what he could really do. And then in the sprint race at Monza, he hit Sonoda on the opening lap. At the time of writing, this is the last time he raced competitively. Despite being at more uncompetitive teams, the flashes were there. But that just adds to the what-ifs even more. Kibitza should have been part of a golden generation, along with Alonso, Rosberg, Hamilton and Vettel. The four just mentioned drivers would win a combined 14 world championships and 213 Grand Prix. There's a lot of people that think that Kibitza was equal to Alonso. Some think he sat in between Alonso and Hamilton. Some think he was as good if not just below Hamilton on the talent spectrum. And in those group of drivers born between kind of 1981 or so and 1989, he probably should have won more races than he did, and if he had indeed replaced Massa in 2012, could Ferrari have properly challenged Red Bull? Alonso was close to winning the 2012 World Championship. Had Kibitza been in a Ferrari too, where would that have stacked up? Would Alonso have had a better chance of winning the championship, or would Kibitza be challenging himself? But like I say, the Ferrari dream never ended. He's now part of the Ferrari hypercar squad in the WEC, driving the 499P and has been pretty damn competitive in it, as well as being pretty good in LMP2 before this, where he was part of the Team WRT outfit that won the LMP2 class in the 2023 World Endurance Championship, the final year of LMP2 being used in that series. This year with AF Corsa, he's finished 4th in Qatar, 8th at Imola, 8th at Spa, retired at Le Mans and was 11th at Sao Paulo. But with Ferrari having a great hypercar, his experience and two young hungry drivers with him in that particular Ferrari, there's actually still a little bit more to give. But there will always be that underlying feeling. What if that Skoda had hit the guardrail at a different angle? What if he made the corner and carried on and finished that rally? What if he went into the 2012 season in a Ferrari? But despite all that, Despite not having the use of his right arm, the guy is still bloody rapid. The determination to drive is still there. He wants to race. It's all he wants to do. He wants to be the best he can be. I would go as far as to say that he is this generation's Alex Zanardi. He has this injury, but he sticks two fingers up to that. It's like he's saying to his arm, you want to try and stop me from racing and achieving my dreams? Go on then, try and stop me. What a bloke. 
So then a look at the career of Robert Kubica and that underlying feeling of how it could have been much more fruitful than it actually was and where he might have stacked up with his contemporaries like Hamilton, Alonso, Rosberg and Vettel. If this video has given you food for thought then do like the video so I know I've done a good job and for more from this channel get subscribed and also get that bell on so you never miss out on any future videos. Massive thanks as ever go out to the rad lads at Patreon that support me at a more personal level and if you want to help keep things running around here then a link to Patreon is in the description along with links to Patreon, socials, Discord and affiliates all there too along with stuff you might want or need to know. Or the super thanks if you want to just buy me a coffee or memberships if you want a Patreon alternative. So until next time I've been Aidan Mord, have a great day wherever you are and goodbye.